Second Chronicles chapter six, verse five and six. It says here, since the day that I brought forth my people out of the land of Egypt, I chose no city among all the tribes of Israel to build an house in, that my name might be there. Neither chose I any man to be a ruler over my people Israel, but I have chosen Jerusalem, that my name might be there, and have chosen David to be over my people Israel. Seems like the Lord's starting to get pretty interested in this city and in these people. Hmm. These Jewish people. Interesting. Turn next to Psalm. The book of Psalms. We're going to go to Psalm 2, verse 6. Psalm 2, verse 6. It says here, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Uh, okay, is it talking about Adam? No, Adam's not the begotten son of God. He's the created son of God. Who's this talking about? Well, if you notice there, it's a capital S. This is a reference to Jesus Christ. A prophetic reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Spoken through David. Hmm. Verse 8, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. You say, wait a second. I thought you said Israel was the inheritance of Jesus Christ, and he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem, and Israel's in his inheritance. But what's he ruling and reigning? A nation with all the Arabs around about it, and everybody else in the UN, and the Catholics, and everything else trying to attack it? No. Jerusalem in the Millennial Kingdom is going to be the capital city of the world. And all the nations are going to come down and are going to be submissive and subservient to the Jews. The physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hello. Sorry, uh, Nazis, replacement theology, Catholics, weirdos. You see, but but the, you know the, the real Jews they've they've passed away. They've been you know they when they went into dispersion they turn into the Khazars and they turn into the into the blah, 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 all that stuff. Then God's a liar. That's what these crazy nuts, these these cultic replacement theology people. That's what they're really saying in reality. When they start this thing of there are no physical Jews anymore. Well, then God's a liar, because God is saying there's a future fulfillment here for the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So when you say there are no more Jews, you're calling God a liar. Verse 9, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Doesn't sound very nice. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. You say, what is that talking about? Oh, I don't know. Natural disasters coming on nations that go against the physical land, the physical nation of Israel. Tell them to give up their physical land that God promised. Kiss the sun lest he be angry. You better have fear of God. And if there are any government politicians watching this, let me just tell you, don't mess with Israel if you know what's good for you. You can kill Christians all day long, whatever, you know, but you mess with Israel, you got God coming down on you. You better be careful. Okay, go next to Psalm 47. Psalm 47, verses 1 through 4. It says, O clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is terrible, he is a great king over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. He shall choose our inheritance for the, us, the excellency of Jacob, whom he loved, Selah. Who is Jacob again? All together now, Israel. Okay, you got that? You say, well, see, Ryan, that's just talking about Jesus, you know, ruling and reigning the millennial kingdom. Oh, well, yeah, it is. But notice there, 
in verse 3, he shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. Um, well, if it's just talking about Jesus Christ, why would it be in the plural? Us and our? Who's it talking about? Physical Jews in a physical land that was promised to them. He shall choose our inheritance for us, the nation of Israel, the physical nation of Israel. Psalm 95. Psalm 95, verse 14. No, wait, I have that wrong. There is no verse 14 in Psalm 95. What did I write that for? Okay, I wrote down the wrong thing there. Um, hmm. Okay, I'm looking forward and back here on the different things here, and I, I did not see where I was trying to get to there. Psalm 94, verse 14. Psalm 94, verse 14. That's one I wanted. For the Lord will not cast off His people, neither will He forsake His inheritance. Now, that's very, very, very important. I'm glad the Lord showed me it was that one and not 95, 14. I want you to think about something. According to every replacement theology heretic out there, they all say that God did cast off His people. God broke the Abrahamic covenant according to replacement theology. And now He shifted from physical people to spiritual Jews. Well then, if that's true, then uh, Psalm 94, 14 here in your King James Bible, David lied. David spoke a false prophecy according to replacement theology heretics. How do you reconcile that? All these wicked little cultists out there. I listened to Stephen Anderson's sermons and he didn't say a thing wrong. He's a wonderful preacher. He knows the Bible far better than you do. He's a la, 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 la. How do you talk about that verse there? Psalm, Psalm 94 verse 14. He says the Jewish people have been cast away. David said, the Lord will not cast off his people. Neither will he forsake his inheritance. Physical people, physical land. What are you going to do with that? Psalm 105. Hopefully I have this reference right. Psalm 105. Where are we at here? Verse 5 through 11. Remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth, O ye seed of Abraham his servant, ye children of Jacob his chosen. What was Jacob again? Israel. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. See it again which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying unto thee will I give the land of Canaan the lot of your inheritance. How do these replacement theology losers, how do you get past that? How do you get past this? You just say, well, actually, you don't understand the verse. A child could understand this. Okay? Anybody that's honest would understand the plain teaching of Scripture here. It's physical land for a physical people. And God confirmed it as an everlasting covenant. You say, well, I don't believe that. I believe the Jewish people have been cast off. Then you're calling God a liar then you are saying that God made a promise that he later broke. You're worshiping a different God than the God of the Bible, if that's your God, that he makes everlasting covenants and then breaks them. You're not worshiping the God of the Bible. And we're going to see about that later, because I know the passages that they're going to try to turn to, and we're going to look at those passages. 
Next, go to Psalm 122. And I had to throw this one in here as we're going through it. Psalm 122, verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. I say, oh, there you go. He's preaching the prosperity gospel. I didn't say that. The Bible said it. Okay? And you say, what's prosper mean? Well, you can prosper in a lot of different ways besides monetarily. You can prosper with good health. You know, when the Bible says, blessed are they that bless thee, cursed are they that curse thee, I don't think being under God's curse is much of a, a uh, blessing or a prospering. See? That's why I'm going to bless the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. I'm going to do my best to try and win some of them to the Lord. I'm going to preach to them. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And you should too. Now we're going to look at some scriptures which no replacement theology heretic will dare to discuss. You want to hang one? Here's where you go. Because see, their biggest argument, you can turn in your Bible to the book of Ezekiel chapter 36. Their biggest argument in the replacement theology circles is that the Jews today are wicked. And see, they can point to all these sins that the Jews are doing. And so they say, see, the Jews are wicked. And therefore, they can't be God's chosen people because God's chosen people are saved Christians. And therefore, we get the promises. We get everything that the nation of Israel should have had. But they rejected Jesus as their Messiah. So then all their promises belong to us now. See, that is replacement theology taught by Catholics since the very beginning. That's why they're going out and they're killing Jews. See, that's why Hitler killed the Jews. Hitler was a Catholic and he had no fear of God. He reads Martin Luther's propaganda against the Jewish people, the Jews and their lies. You know, on the Jews and their lies was the actual title of it. He reads that thing, Hitler does, and he goes, I don't have to fear these Jews. I don't have to fear any kind of a curse coming from God. I can kill these people. I can slaughter them. Just like these Catholic replacement theology people do today. But let's look here. I'm going to show you the verses that debunk this whole system. Ezekiel 36, verse 21. But I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. So the house of Israel in this passage then would be bad. They'd be in sin, right? Because they're profaning God's holy name. So then we're going to see that God just cuts them off and they become the Khazars and, the, and the, all these other weird names and everything and there's no more physical Jews, right? Keep reading. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine own, or for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither, whither ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. You know what the heathen, you know what the, one of the quickest ways that you can prove the Bible is true to somebody that's heathen, to somebody that's lost? You know one of the things that led me to the Lord back when I really got saved? The rebirth of the nation of Israel. An ancient people, an ancient kindred, an ancient nation with an ancient language is just gone and all of a sudden, boom, right back to their homeland that the Bible talks about, and they get their language back, they get their government back, just like that, as prophesied in Matthew chapter 24. The rebirth of the nation of Israel is the keystone, the most important end-time prophecy that there is. I mean, D.L. Moody talked about he had gone over to Palestine, that they called it back then, and he was sad because there was no nation of Israel in his day. He died in 1899. Nation of Israel is 1948, when it was first formed. Ironically, the very first day that there was any kind of political action taken before 1948, it was July the 7th of 1937, I believe it was. Interesting, because it was my birthday. You know, not the year, of course, I'm not that old, but, you know, it was the day of my birth. Interesting. But 
D.L. Moody went over there wanting to see the nation of Israel, and he was sad, and he said, I wish I could see the nation of Israel as a, as a country with its own people again, and its own, with its own government, and its own language, and its own laws and everything, because he said, then I might be alive to see the rapture. Yeah. It's written about in one, of the, the one book I have here, uh, right there. No, that's no, right over here. The Life of D.L. Moody by His Son. Written about right there. Hmm. You see, all the end time prophecies could be there, but if, na if the nation of Israel was not reborn, all the other prophecies fall away. Israel has to be a nation for all the other end time prophecies to be fulfilled. They have to be back in their homeland. So that's why it says here, I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes, and you, Israel, before their eyes the world's eyes. Verse 24, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Hmm. Is that happening? Yeah. Yeah, it is. All these Jews are going back to the nation of Israel. Why? Why? Because they're wicked and the Illuminatis have conspired and, and the Rothschilds and all these other people, they're, the, the, you know, they're conspiring at the nation of Israel's the Zionist conspiracy and blah, blah, blah. Uh, no, you Satanist. No, the fact of the matter is because God is bringing them back. God's the one bringing them back. You say, according to what? According to Scripture. You'll try reading it sometime. You say, but see, they're coming back... Um, uh, in, in, that because they're all saved. They're all Christians, right? Uh, no, you read the verses there, and, and God's saying, I'm not even doing this for your sake. I'm doing it for my sake. Why? Because God made an everlasting covenant, and He will not break His word. That's why. So even though the Jews, many of them don't even believe in God, there's athe atheistic Jews and all these this wicked stuff that they're part of and everything, I'm not defending everything that the Jews do because I stand up for the nation of Israel. The Jews are a wicked people now. If a Jew dies in their sins, they go to hell. They cannot get saved unless they put their faith in Jesus Christ. All right? Understand that. I, because I believe in the nation of Israel and fight for the nation of Israel, I'm not justifying everything that they do. Neither is the Lord here in this passage. He's saying, I'm not doing this for your sakes. Because you are wicked, you are causing my name to be blasphemed among the heathen just as the nation of Israel does today. Why are they being brought back? Because God made an everlasting covenant. He made a promise for physical people in physical land. But look what happens once they come back. Verse 25, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit. Spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments, and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the corn, and will increase it, and lay no more famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field, that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Then shall ye remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. See where I'm reading to here. Not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord God, be it known unto you, be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, In the day that I shall have cleansed you with all, from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the wastes shall be builded, and the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And they shall say that this land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and, and desolate <coughs> ruin and ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. Then the heathen that are left round about you shall know that I, the Lord, builded, build the ruined places and plant that that was desolate. 
I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Thus saith the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel, to do it for them. I will increase them with men like a flock. As the holy flock, as the flock of Jerusalem in her solemn feasts, so shall the waste cities be filled with flocks of men, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Hmm. Did the, you say, well, Brian, that's a prophecy of the first coming. Did it happen? No. They rejected Jesus Christ the first time. That's not a prophecy of the first coming. It's a prophecy of the second advent. When Jesus Christ physically touches down to rule and reign from that city of Jerusalem. But isn't it interesting that they come back in unbelief and then get saved? How about that? Kind of debunks the whole system of replacement theology, doesn't it? Turn to the book of Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1. It says here, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens, and layeth the foundation of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. In that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth shall be gathered together against it. Boy, there's no prophetic fulfillment there today. How much fighting has there been in Jerusalem and in that area? It's gone on for years and years and years, ever since they became a nation. Fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting. Why? Because the people around them will not give them their land that God promised them. And you say, well, then they should stop trying to take the land. No, because God's the one who's bringing them back. Remember what we just read there in the book of Ezekiel? God's the one who's bringing the Jews to their land, their physical land. Prophecy is being fulfilled. And we're over here in this little side pocket called the church age where God has temporarily just said, okay, my plans for the nation of Israel, I'm going to put them off for a little bit. And you people, anybody can get saved in this time. No respect of persons. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. Everybody gets saved. Okay? You want to get saved? Get saved. You want to reject the Lord? Go ahead. You go to hell. You know? That's the way it's working. But God's starting to turn His focus back to the nation of Israel. They're back in their land. The physical land that He, pro that he promised to a physical people. Verse 4, In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment, and his rider with madness, and I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah, and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in the Lord of hosts their God. In that day will I make the governors of Judah like an hearth of fire among the wood, and like a torch of fire in a sheaf. And they shall devour all the people round about, on the right hand and on the left. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. Is that true today? Yes. But they don't have all of it yet. And once we get rid of that, mo that pesky mosque of Omar over there in Jerusalem, things will really be good, because then they can rebuild their temple. Verse 7, The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. Hmm. Is Jerusalem pretty powerful militarily? Oh, yeah. Some of the best firearms that have been created in the last however many years, 20, 30 years, are Jewish firearms, Israeli military arms. Hmm. It's like prophecy coming to pass. Verse 9, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. See there again, that's why a lot of these people can't stand the truth of the Bible. They want to get rid of Israel 
because they understand that it's going to mean the destruction of their own nation. They don't like that. Verse 10, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. You say, Brian, that's talking about spiritual Jews. Praise the Lord, we're spiritual Jews. Why would you mourn when you see Jesus Christ showing up? I'm not going to mourn when I see Jesus Christ showing up. I'm going to be happy when I see my Savior show up. But what if you're a Jew? What if you're Jewish and you think back through the generations, you think about your family back through the generations and you realize they're all in hell. They all rejected the Messiah. For nearly 2,000 years, our people rejected our Messiah our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We rejected Him all that time. And there He is. Right there. You better believe they're going to have a reason to mourn. They rejected their King. I didn't reject the King. I'm not going to mourn when I see Jesus Christ. But those Jews will. That are located physically in Jerusalem. Verse 11. In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadad Rimon in the valley of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart, the family of Shimei apart, and their wives apart. All the families that remain, every family apart and their wives apart. It's going to be a lot of weeping when they realize Jesus was their Messiah. And all their ancestors, all their relatives could have been saved. Hmm. Interesting prophecy there. You say, but Brian, is there a, is there a New Testament tie into this whole thing? I mean, you're showing us verses from the Old Testament. How about the Pauline epistles? Well, let's go to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Watch ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. And it goes on down through there. We're not going to read the whole thing. But the fact is, he's not talking about spiritual Jews up there. He's talking about physical Jews. And he's saying, did God cast away his people? God forbid. But if you're a replacement theology heretic, you say, yes, God did cast away his people. We're his people now. That doesn't even make any sense. Hath God cast away the Christians? God forbid, for I also am a Christian. Huh? That's not what Paul's saying. Of course God, God didn't cast away Christians. You know, why would Paul even write something so dumb? He's not writing about Christians, spiritual Jews. He's writing about physical Jews. You say, how do I know that? I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Show me anywhere where Christians are supposed to be called tribes. We're supposed to organize ourselves in one of the 12 tribes. Show me in the Pauline epistles. See, these people are so messed up. The replacement theology crowd. But let's look down to verse 25. Verse 25 there in Romans chapter 11. And read the whole chapter. I mean, I'm not trying to skip anything here. Read the whole chapter. You'll see the thing of the Israelites. They, they've rejected Jesus as their Messiah. And God says, okay, I'm going to put you over there for the time being, but I'm going to bring you back. You see, how do you know that? Verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. What mystery? Keep reading. 
lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Blindness in part, not in whole. God didn't say, I'm, I'm just done with Israel. They're just, they're gone. In part. Blindness in part. Now look at verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant. Covenant. Where did we read about a covenant that was made? The Abrahamic covenant confirmed to his son Isaac and to his son Jacob. Jacob is Israel. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Hmm. Their sins. Verse 28. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. They're not saved. And most Jews have rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah. I'm going to be doing some, some videos in the future. Uh, there's some arguments about New Testament scriptures that are supposed to be, you know, Old Testament, you know, fulfilled. Old Testament scriptures, excuse me, that are fulfilled in the New Testament and, and debates about, you know, the different wording and stuff there. I'm going to, you know, I'm putting some stuff together on it. It's going to be pretty detailed, so that's why it's going to take me a little bit. But a Jew today does not accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah. So according to the gospel, they're enemies. They're no different than a Catholic or a Muslim or a Hindu or whatever. They rejected Jesus Christ. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Hmm. So uh, what's the election there? Oh, that uh, inheritance that God has? Where the Lord said, uh, I chose that one group right over there. There's Jews. Come here. You're mine. You're my inheritance. In that city, Jerusalem, the Lord says, I'm going to rule from that city. Rule and reign the whole earth from one city. And one nation is going to be the greatest nation on earth at that point in time. That's what's going on there. Let's go back to Romans 9. Romans chapter 9, verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, all that saved people, right? Keep reading. My kinsmen according to the spirit? Uh, no, it's according to the flesh. You say, well, uh, Paul was obviously speaking about Christians because they are the spiritual seed. They are born in of adoption, spirit of adoption. And therefore, we know that the Jews at this time were dispersed and there were no more true Jews according to the flesh. And Yeah, okay, replacement theology, weirdos. Look at verse 4. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises Whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who was over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, the King of the Jews. He was a Jew. That's why in Luke chapter 3, you're given the genealogy of the bloodline that he, of the people that he was born into, the kindred. His bloodline, God was his father, Mary was his mother, but she's a Jew. His family is Jewish. For the prophecies to be fulfilled, he had to be a Jew. But people say, you're not going to cover Romans 2.28, are you? Because 2.28 is where you're debunked, Brian. That's where replacement theology stands boldly, you know. We're going to cover Romans chapter 2, verse 28. Okay, Romans 2, 28. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Well, there you go. 
overthrows the Abrahamic covenant, overthrows all the promises of the physical people and the physical land. Everything is just null and void because of Romans 2, 28 and 29. Right? Well, if you're stupid enough to listen to Tex Mars or Steven Anderson, then yeah, that's, that's enough for your little pea brain to be able to handle. Okay? There's not enough scripture in there, and many of these people, I mean, I've had some of Stephen Anderson's followers, his little cult followers coming onto my channel, and they're using profanity in the comments. And, I'll, and you know, a couple of, of you have noticed the fact that when they talk about God or Jesus, it's lowercase g, lowercase j. They don't even care enough about the Lord to capitalize. Take time to push the shift button and then the letter. I mean, I know that's very difficult, you know, I mean, it takes some hand-eye coordination, which apparently the followers of Steven Anderson don't have. You know, I mean, it, I know it probably is even making their brains hurt just thinking about it. But try it sometime, you know. It's, enlighten yourself, you know. I mean, try to come up to the next level, you know, here. Get out of the nursery sometime. Try capitalizing the G and the, and the J. Unless you're not saved, then you can do whatever you want. But let's, uh, let's see what this, these verses actually say in context. Romans chapter 2, let's go up to verse 17. That's something that Stephen Anderson is absolutely famous for. He is a cherry picker, so to speak. They, they go and they pick a couple verses of scriptures out here and there, and, they, and he never gives you the whole context of the whole thing. Okay? Let's read here. Romans chapter 2, verse 17. Behold, thou art called a... Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which hast the form of knowledge, and of the truth in the law. Would that have been true of a Jew in the first century? Yeah. Oh, sure. Absolutely. They were the ones that were coming out of the Old Testament. They got the whole system there. They know all the stories of the Bible and everything else. And you get this pagan Greek person over here. They come along and it's, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. And they're going, well, yeah, okay, I believe, you know, I'm a sinner. I, I need to get saved. And, and you know, yeah, okay, I, I understand this. And they say, yeah, well, that's good, you know. And you, you ought to study the story of Moses sometime and, and Noah and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And this Greek pagan is going... Who? Huh? What are you talking about? See, they are, they are at a tremendous disadvantage because they don't understand things like a Jew, a physical Jew, you know, like they would understand. Yeah. And there's a lot of things today I don't understand about the Bible and understand about the Old Testament and things because I'm not a Jew. You know? I don't understand a lot of those things. I haven't had the benefits of, of being brought up in some of that, the Jewish types of, of teachings and customs. And I'd love to be able to know Hebrew and things like that. I mean, that's probably not going to happen for a while. But, you know, if ever, I don't know if the Lord's ever going to give me the time to study the Hebrew language, but it's an interesting thing to me. I believe that Hebrew is the ultimate language and all the other languages in the world are mixed up Hebrew. That's a very interesting study. If you ever want to watch, so there's a Jewish rabbi, Mordecai Kraft. You can see some of his stuff on it. He's not a saved man, but, you know, the point is he really, you know, shows some really interesting things about the Hebrew language. And you say, what should you do about that guy? Well, I should hate him and call him the synagogue of Satan and just hate his guts. And th No, I pray for him. We have been praying for the man every single night since, I don't even know. Months and months and months, maybe even a year now. I don't even know. I mean, it's been a long time. We've been praying for the man every night. I pray for his salvation. I pray the Lord protects him. I'd, I'd like to see the guy get saved before the you know, rapture. So he gets out and it doesn't have to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. But let's continue here. Verse 21. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. Who's the you? 
the physical Jews. Remember what we read back there in the book of Ezekiel? The name of God is blasphemed because of the Jewish people. And God says, I'm not doing this for your sake. I'm doing it for my name's sake. I'm going to bring you back to the land for my sake, that I can be sanctified through you to the, to the heathen people. Verse 25, For circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Doesn't mean that God got rid of the physical Jews there. All he's saying is, hey, you, get, you have a great benefit as a Jew. You know, the circumcision. What was the circumcision? What did we learn earlier? It's a token of the covenant, of that inheritance. God says to Abraham, he says, hey, circumcise yourself and all the men that are in your house above eight days old. That's interesting too. Circumcise yourselves as a token, as a sign that you're different than the other people. That's interesting. But he's saying, so you, circumcision is, is a definite benefit, but if, if you can't keep the whole law, then you're no different than a heathen. You know, a Jew today, if they can't keep the whole law, nobody can. If they can't keep the whole, whole law, they'll die and go to hell just like a, a Muslim or a Buddhist or an African tribesman out in the whatever. They're no different than the heathen. That's what's going on here. God's not saying he's done with the Jews. Let's continue. Verse 26, Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? Now we're starting to deal in the spiritual here. See? He's saying that special place that you have, salvation is of the Jews, you know, that special place that you have in God's sight. You get somebody who's uncircumcised, they can actually get into that position that you should be in as a circumcised Jew. Verse 27, And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, a Gentile in other words, judge thee, a Jew, who by the letter and circumcision dost transgress the law? See? So Paul is switching from physical to now spiritual. And he says, verse 28, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. You say, well, see, Brian, right there, the Jews have been done away with. God just cut them off. Well, first of all, you still have to deal with Romans chapter 9 and Romans chapter 11, which the replacement theology heretics can't. But even worse than that, you have to go on to chapter 3. You know, a text without a context is a pretext. Romans chapter 3. What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? So Paul, if he had just done away with the Jews, the Jewish people according to the flesh, why is he going on then saying, hey, what profit is there of being a physical Jew? Of the circumcision. Verse 2. Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. What are the oracles of God? The Bible. Holy Scripture. Given to the Jews. So what advantage has a Jew? Much. See, a Jew can look at this and they can say, yeah, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, yeah. Yeah, well, Jacob, I can actually trace my family back. I can trace my family tree back to that bloodline. I can't. You know, again, a lot of people are like, Oh, you look Jewish, Brian. You look Jewish. Well, I might look Jewish, but my brothers and sisters have blonde hair. Green eyes, blue eyes, whatever else. And they don't look like me. And, it, you know, they look somewhat like me. I'm not adopted or anything like that, you know. But I, my older sister, she has dark hair. But then my... I have two other brothers and, and a younger sister. They all look different. And I have the darkest hair of the whole family. I'm the only one that can grow a good beard and things like that. You know? And I'm the tallest one and everything. And, and you know, so to, to think that, well, you know, I'm a Jew and I just secretly went into Germany and we changed our name to a German name, Denlinger and stuff like this. No, no, sorry. You know, I'm not a Jew. 
Okay, I'm of Japheth. I can't say, this is my family tree right here. Now, if I was a Jew, I could. That would be an advantage, wouldn't it? I can't tell you where my ancestors are at in this book. You can see some of the things, you know, you go back to Roman or, or Genesis chapter 10, you can see kind of the Isles of the Gentiles and some of the things. But a lot of the stuff about the descendants of Japheth, it just isn't recorded. You know why? Because God doesn't care. God only chose one people, the nation of Israel. There's some mentions of other nations and things like that, but he didn't care enough to write down, this guy begot so-and-so, this guy begot so-and-so, this guy begot so-and-so. Why did God write all that stuff? Do you ever think about that? I mean, you're trying to read through the Bible, you hit the book of Numbers and things like this, and it's so-and-so begot so-and-so, so-and-so begot so-and-so, lived so many years, begot so-and-so, lived so many years, begot so-and-so, and you're going... What's well, the Bible? I'm going to read through it, you know. But boy, it's in Genesis, it's in Numbers, it's even in Luke chapter 3 like we saw earlier. What's the big deal? The big deal, brethren, is because God made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for physical descendants that get physical land. And that land is still available today and it's still being fought for today and it just cracks me up you get all these people that are coming out that are saying that they're Jews and they're not okay physical Jews and they're not I'm a Jew I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Hebrew Israelite I'm the true Jews we're the true Jews then get to Jerusalem and fight like a mad crazy individual against all those hundreds of millions of Arabs, of Muslims that are surrounding Jerusalem and that are saying, we're going to destroy Israel. And they get out of line a little bit and they're, and they're killing them and they're stabbing them and they're doing all kinds of stuff to those Jewish people. I mean, go on over there to that nation and just get surrounded by hostile enemies and see how, how much of a Jew you really are. You know, I mean... If you are the true Jews, you're the replacement Jews, you're the real true Israel, why are you wasting your time over in America, in the UK, Australia, wherever you're at? God's promised you a special piece of land, an inheritance, a physical inheritance. It's an everlasting covenant, isn't it? God's not a man that he should lie. God promised the Jews that land, so if you're a spiritual Jew, go on over. Standing on the promises, you know. I mean, you get these, these Anderson heretics and they're like saying, I don't believe in dispensations. Everything in the Bible is mine from Genesis to Revelation. Every single thing. Okay. Hey, princess. God said that there's a piece of land over there. In Genesis chapter 15. From the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. Go fight for it. Do you believe God? God gave the promise to somebody, you say every promise is yours, then God will protect you. Go on over there and fight against the Arab nations with their weapons of war provided by Russia and some of these other countries and things. Go on over and fight them. God's on your side. Every promise is yours. Try it out. Come on. So what's God's future plan for the Jews? Well, the next big thing to happen is the removal of the bride of Christ. And I will say this too. I'm not sure if the temple mount there, if, you know, some people say, well, the temple, the, the rebuilt temple could be actually built right now. It could just be built some other place where the, other than where the Mosque of Omar is at. You know, I don't know. But the fact is, I think there's a good chance that the Mosque of Omar, Omar is going to be destroyed, that Muslim pagan temple with the womb of Isis thing. I actually had a, uh, somebody comment on that. Thank you for that comment. The, what is the rounded dome on these big Babel buildings like the Vatican and stuff? They said it's the womb of Isis. It's a, another pagan uh, fertility symbol. And I did check it out, by the way. It's true. But um, removal of the Bride of Christ. The Bride of Christ cannot, or the, the Antichrist and this whole system cannot happen until the Bride of Christ is left. 
Now we're off the scene, and now God can turn his attention back to that chosen people, the nation of Israel. He's bringing them back to the land right now. See? And now he's going to have to prove the New Testament to them through signs and wonders. The Jews require a sign. Revelation, the book of Revelation. Seven years of signs and wonders. And Moses and Elijah preaching to the Jewish people. So you have the removal of the bride of, the bride of Christ. You have the release of the Antichrist. Twenty-four elders and a great multitude in heaven, which are redeemed out of every kindred, tongue, people, nation, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. They're in heaven before the first seal is open and the Antichrist is unleashed. Uh, who would that be? You say Old Testament saints. Can't be. They're Jews. Only Jews. It's the body of Christ is in heaven before the first seal is open. Oh, and the uh, 24 elders are crowned, by the way. When are you crowned as a Christian? At the judgment seat of Christ. So how could they be crowned if Christians aren't in heaven until after the tribulation? Maybe I ought to do a little bit more study instead of listening to some of these liars, these novices like Stephen Anderson. And, you know, he's probably not even a novice. I think he's just a false prophet. But then you have a peace treaty between the Jews and the Arabs, which would be really needed if something happened to that Mosque of Omar. I think that would probably lead to some pretty violent fighting. So the Antichrist comes in, makes the peace treaty between the Jews and the Arabs. You can read about that in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Um, the Jews rebuild their temple in Jerusalem. I think that's when that's going to happen. Moses and Elijah return to preach to the Jews. Read about that in the book of Revelation, the two witnesses. And again, oh, it's the, the Jews are gone. The, the, there's no more physical Jews. The Jews are all away. They're all bad. They're all evil in Jerusalem. And those aren't really the true Jews. They're the synagogue of Satan and blah, blah. Then why is God sending back down Moses and Elijah? Moses, the law, Elijah, the prophets. Why is that? I don't need to see Moses and Elijah. I don't need to have Moses and Elijah preach to me. And they come back and it's interesting because the things that they're doing, the miracles that they're doing, are the same things that Moses did before Pharaoh in Egypt when he was bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt. And Jerusalem in the time of Jacob's trouble was called Sodom and Egypt. And what did the Jews have to do? They had to leave it. After three and a half years, the Antichrist sets himself up in the temple to be worshipped. Executes Moses and Elijah. They go back up to heaven. He sets himself up in the temple to be worshipped. Says, I'm God. You worship me now. Jews must flee Jerusalem and endure to the end to be saved. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. I'm not having to endure to the end to be saved. But the Jews will be in that time. Jesus and the saints arrived to destroy the Antichrist and his army. Excuse me. Revelation chapter 19. Read about that. Jesus sets up his throne in Jerusalem and judges those nations that are remaining. Matthew chapter 25. The judgment of the nations. That's what's going on. And you say, what about the separation of the wheat and the tares? That's the judgment of the nations. The tares go into the furnace to be burned. The wheat goes into the kingdom, the, the garner there. They go in to the kingdom. They inherit the kingdom. You say, well, that has to be the rapture. No, because the rapture of the body of Christ, the, the, the dead and living saints go up first. The dead which are in Christ. That's not the wicked being taken to judgment. That's another one of these lies that these post-tribbers try to make. It's so absurd. They can't rightly divide the word of truth, so they mess it up. But anyhow, um, the saved Jews enter the millennium and Jesus rules the world from Jerusalem and the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant promised by an everlasting perpetual covenant that God cannot disannul, he cannot break, the Jews for the first time get the land and they get a king sitting on the throne in Jerusalem that can rule and reign and there's no more this son did evil in the sight of the Lord. The father was a good king. The son was a bad king. And then he went back to a good king. And then the next son came and he was a bad king. None of that. One thousand year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ from Jerusalem. His inheritance. And that's why I get so worked up about this system. 
when these people come out and they say the Jews are no more. There are no more physical Jews. Those Jews that are over there, and it's always so funny. They say, on one hand, there are no physical Jews. On the other hand, the Jews that are in Israel are wicked and evil in the synagogue of Satan. Huh? What? How does that work? See? These people are nuts. You know, the fact of the matter is, God's word is coming true. And if you believe in replacement theology, if you have been bought into the system of Stephen Anderson, I realize that there are some people that are very ignorant on this issue that, that don't really know what the Bible says, and they get called in by Stephen Anderson's little charismatic delivery that he does, his little show that he puts on. They get called in by that thing. And I'm telling you right now, you better repent of that thing, and you better get as far away from him as you can and I've seen brethren that have watched my ministry, that have watched other good ministries out there, and they start, oh, like, you know, I know that, I know, Brian, that you say that you shouldn't listen to Stephen Anderson, but I just like to watch him occasionally. Um, brethren, when I warn about a false prophet, it's not because I don't like their personality, or I don't like the way they smell, or I don't like the position of their nose and their eyes. Or I know false prophets I studied for 10 years before even entering the ministry. Okay, and I'm not saying that to brag. I'm not saying that to say, you know, oh, look at me, look at me. I'm a wonderful guy. I'm not saying that. I consider my ministry to be the most serious thing in my life. Very, very, very serious. And the Lord showed me a lot of things, a whole lot of things. And when I'm warning you about Stephen Anderson, it's because I know what his system is. That's why I'm warning you about him. Stay away from him. You say, well, you're just trying to get me away from him, so I'll watch you. Don't watch me then. Don't watch anybody. Hey, here's an idea. Get rid of the internet. Just read the Bible and study it for yourself. You know, that's what I did for a long time. That's what most of my learning comes from. Not from the internet, but from preaching and teaching. What do you think all this stuff is back here? I read. I read a lot of books. I'm not some kind of a, a ignorant little laity that doesn't know anything. You know? I mean, occasionally you have to speak foolishly because people just, Oh, you're nobody. You're nothing. You know, I've been saved for three weeks now, and I have the same authority as Brian Dellinger does. You're a novice. You don't know what you're talking about. And if you watch Stephen Anderson, he will bring a curse upon your home. When you start to go against those Jewish people, that's what you got coming. You want that? Hurricanes, tornadoes, natural disasters, bad things coming upon your family? Do you want that? You say, I would like to because it'd make me a stronger Christian. Then have at it. But you stay away from me. I'm not interested in getting the, the curse of God on my life, on my family. I don't want the curse of God. I want God's blessing upon me, upon my wife. That's what I want. <laughs> you know, I, I just want to say this, and that is that a lot of people, you know, get confused by me when I start speaking very harshly, when I get very, very arrogant and, and everything else. But brethren, there are some things that scare me. And they scare me not in that I don't fear God anymore and I fear this more than I fear God. I fear these things because I know what God can do to a nation. And if you're watching this study on YouTube, you've got life pretty good. Okay, I'm reading a book right now. I'm going to be talking about this in the future. It's called Tortured for Christ. It's a book by Richard Vermbrand a saved Jew from Romania that was tortured horribly at the hands of the atheistic communists. Brethren, when God turns his back on a nation, things can get very horrible. He told stories of Christians, ministers, that had their fingernails ripped out. Women that were knocked on the ground by the secret police and had all the teeth kicked out of their face. Christians that were stripped naked and laid down on crosses on the floor, tied down on crosses, and other prisoners forced to urinate and defecate in their face and then smear their 
feces all over that naked Christian laying there, and then they'd hang him up like that on the cross. Tortures that you can't even fathom. You know why? Well, because a lot of those countries turned on the Jews during World War II. And you know what's going to happen to America if we nationally turn on the Jews? And the more Christians turn against the Jews, you know what's going to happen? We're going to go right into that. I fear that. I don't want to ever be tortured for Christ. I'm a realist. I'm not going to say, bless God, brother, I could handle it. Man, I can handle torture. I'd never deny Jesus Christ. Hey, man, I know what pain is. I have experienced pain in my life. I don't like pain. Okay? I have a very high pain tolerance. I've done a lot of things and things like that. You know, I've, I had a tooth the one time that, was, that needed to come out, and I pulled it out myself. You say, that hurt a little bit? It hurt a lot. <laughs> and I got it done. No Novocaine, no dentist, no nothing. I pulled out my own tooth. So I'm not a sissy. I'm not a wimp. But I'll tell you what, there are tortures that they can do, the Catholics and the atheists and Muslims and stuff, which they're all Catholics. The point is, God is protecting our nation because America has always sided with Israel. But when America starts to step back and say, hey, whoa, wait, I'm not going to side with you. You need to give that land back. They're going against the promises of God. And brethren, you need to be careful when you follow ministries that are doing that. I mean, go back to World War II Germany. And Joseph Goebbels is there and he's saying, these Jews, these wicked Jews, they control the media. They're doing all this other stuff. They're Zionists. They're this, they're that. And the German people are... Yay! Heil Hitler! Yay! What were those German people doing 10 years later? Sorting through the rubble of their homes that were destroyed in the bombings? Killed in the fire bombings that America did? The Russian soldiers came in and raped every single woman, young women up to the old women. Oh yeah. Romania was controlled by the Nazis. And then the Russians came in and brought in communism. Why? They stood against the Jews. Don't mess with Israel. You do not want to mess with Israel. That's why I have a great fear when I see some guy who professes to be a King James Bible-believing preacher and he's coming out attacking the Jews. You know what I did when I found out Tex Mars started to go against the Jews? I remember back in the old days, Tex Mars would defend the nation of Israel. And he said, I remember him saying in one of his Power of Prophecy videos, I think it was called Thunder Over Zion, and he said in that video, he said, we will not tolerate anything against the Jewish people. No time at all, Tex Mars is speaking against the Jews. Everything is the fault of the Jews. Obama is the Rothschild's choice. George W. Bush is a crypto Jew. Obama is a crypto Jew. Everybody's crypto Jew that stands for Israel. You know what I did with Tex Mars's things? Burned them. I might have another book or two and stuff like that just to show that he's wicked. But the things that I, that I had that were in support of Tex Mars gone. I suggest you get away from Stephen Anderson's ministry. Run away from it. Don't speak against the Jews. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, that I have been given the privilege to be born in, to be grafted into that spiritual family of the Jewish people. I'm an adopted child, Lord, of the seed of Abraham. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would forgive any kind of thoughts I ever had against the Jewish people because of some of the, the uh, wicked apostates, the, or not apostates, the false prophets I used to listen to, like the Tex Mars and some of the others. I pray you forgive me for that, Lord. And I just ask, Lord, that you would please um, help anybody out there that's under these wicked influences, that they would run away from them and get away before your judgment comes upon this nation. And I pray, Lord, for the peace of Jerusalem. I pray for your holy protection upon those people over there, Lord. Even the most wicked, 
Jew that hates you and hates your word and mocks Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, for your protection upon them so that they might be saved in the time of Jacob's trouble, so that they might be one of the ones that, that hears the preaching of Moses and Elijah and gets converted. Lord, as, as the Apostle Paul, a very, very wicked Jew, hated Christians, hunted us down, and yet he got saved. And it is because of that Jewish man, a Jew according to the flesh, that we can have eternal life now, Lord, that he wrote to us and told us how to be saved. And it is because of our Jewish Savior that we can now go to heaven when we die. I thank you, Lord, for that gift. And I just pray, Lord, that everyone out there would really seek your, your will in their lives. And I ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. That's going to be it for this study. Uh, boy, I just, I really pray that you're taking heed of this, brethren. Um, I can personally say that I was starting to fall for some of the anti-Semitic stuff. I was starting to fall for some of that horrible satanic filth and, and, um, and some bad things happened in my life. I can tell you that. And I'm not going to stand against the Jews anymore. I'm going to defend the nation of Israel. And if those Jews ever come and, and ever try to hurt me or my wife or whatever, I'm still not going to hate them. They're God's chosen people. God has an everlasting covenant that He made with them. So that's going to be it for this study. Please don't let anybody talk you out of your support for the nation of Israel. Okay? That's going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. And please keep us in your prayers. And uh, we will continue to preach the Word of God.